It owes its origins to, uh, like many things, previous governors and uh, an archaeological survey of, of the Isle of Man uh, in the 1880s. Uh, the, originally, the organisation is the Ancient Monuments Trustees. Uh, these were people who were charged with making a list of what was still visible in the fields um, and, and, and villages around around the island. Quite an emphasis on prehistoric monuments, uh, of which there are quite a lot uh, still visible. And uh, the trustees were charged with the care of, of, of those. And um, one of the first uh, uh, references you find in Tinwald is is um, money being found to pay a stonemason to do some repair work at Hango Hill, and that's back in the 1880s. Um, the subsequently, the trustees felt that a museum was going to be important. There was a lot of there had been private museums, more like waxworks or, or um, you know, Victorian entertainments. Um, but the feeling was, was that the island was missing out in um, in not having a public museum. Public museums have been built in the UK from the 1840s onwards. Um, uh, there was permission; you know, people could put money on in, onto the rates to build museums, and the island didn't have one. Um, so there was lots of pressure. The the governor was very happy for some things to be put into Castle Russian uh, once that stopped being used as a prison. Um, so there's a brief period of time when um, uh, the skeleton of the elk, uh, a famous giant deer that's still in the museum now but was originally in Castle Russian, casts of the Manx crosses, um, curios that people had given uh, these were assembled in Castle Russian, but it wasn't until 1923 that the um, the trustees of the uh, the Henry Noble Hospital um, uh, felt that uh, the old hospital building uh, would be suitable for a museum, and uh, and it and it opened then. And in terms of the role, how does that differ from what the the original ethos behind setting up the Manx Museum and National Trust? The organisation at its core does exactly the same things and in some cases the monuments that we're looking at that were established in the 1880s are the ones we still look after t today uh, because they are significant parts of the island's heritage but the growth of the um, uh, trust and the organization really is from the 1950s and then again from the, from the, the in the 1980s um, even back of the uh, even as far back as the before the first the Second World War, uh, Craig Niche was being added. Harry Kelly's cottage was declared an ancient monument, um, and then gradually added to. But the fifties and sixties didn't see much much growth, and even by the early seventies, uh, the only addition was was the grove. So um, the grammar school, the nautical, the, the the grove, and the Manx Museum, and Craig Niche were were it. Uh, the late 1980s saw a significant expansion with the transfer of Peel Castle, uh, Castle Russian and the Laxey Wheel, which had been held by the government property trustees. And as a group, they were, they were um, given to the Manx Museum and National Trust to look after. Um, in parallel with that, there'd been lots of private donations so that the organisation had become known as the Manx Museum and National Trust because there was already quite a lot of land being acquired, uh, land at the Sound, at Macold and, and Marine Drive. So the organisation has continued to grow. And then uh, more, more significantly, 20 years ago, the House of Manannan was built, a, you know, a £6 million tourist attraction, I think you would describe it purely and simply, and initiatives such as New Cafe at the Sound, Russian Abbey, um, and and so on. So the museum has co just continued to grow uh, as a as an organisation, so that now it has a very wide range of primary functions, and um, the primary function of looking after library materials, of archive materials, of museum collections, of historic buildings, of historic land, have been supplemented by things which are not primary functions, but people expect them. So the shop, the cafes, you know, catering, education, marketing, online services, uh, these are all relatively new, but most people would say, well, they are essential to a visit to, to, to a user. The most, I, I use the example, the most common question ever asked of our staff is, where are the toilets? Um, 
and so it's that basic human need uh, of toilets, of catering, of, of food and dr- drink, um, of the desire to shop, um, uh, that we increasingly wrap round those core functions of caring for the heritage. And if you are a visitor, no matter whether you come from from Peel or from Pennsylvania, uh, you still need the the, the basics uh, alongside it. Now there is a diverse portfolio of sites that uh, MNH looks after. Um, you mentioned some of them there, some of the more, more obvious attractions, but you also manage lands as well. I mean, how what sort of acreage are you talking about there? The the, the Manx Museum and National Trust uh, looks after about three thousand acres of land. Now a, bi- a big chunk of those are on the calf. Um, and then there's a mule peninsula. Um, Fort Island out near Lang- Langness uh, is in our possession. There's a strip of land near, close to us now in the studio uh, along Marine Drive, um, between Marine Drive and the sea. That's a lot of way on that. And at Mackle, we've got a very interesting area uh, between the, the lighthouse, the church, and, and the Mackle Brews. And how are those lands managed? I mean, how, mu- how much, I suppose, interference is there with them? Are they just, just left? Are they conserved in some way? Is, is there a process of uh, managing those lands? The landscape of the Isle of Man is a hugely significant part of its identity and its, and its culture. And it's no surprise to us that we uh, were, seen, were deemed worthy of the biosphere status because there's probably only a few square metres of land uh, in the entire island that don't owe what they are now to some kind of human intervention in, in the past. Humans have been active on the Isle of Man for about 10,000 years. Um, and it's almost exactly 10,000 years because the radiocarbon dates of Mesolithic material at Ronald's Way have have come back and said, it's that old. Um, so people have been uh, cutting down trees. Uh, they've, they've been living off the land. They've been farming. Uh, they've been collecting birds' eggs or seashells um, and so on. They've been working within a landscape. And the way people graze a landscape with, with their, their, their flocks or they dig drainage channels to power uh, either a mill in the medieval period or the laxi wheel in the 19th century. Those have all had an impact on the landscape. So something that, that looks looks green and, and pleasant now, and there are large parts of laxi, for example, and, and increasingly foxtail, that look green and pleasant, but um, it's not long ago that they are... Uh, quite a, a scarred industrial landscape. So what we do in time to look after land, and we work very closely with people like DEFA and the Wildlife Trust uh, on, on understanding and managing landscapes, um, is to try and identify what's significant, what's special, what species are there, why they're there. And then really it's a question of intervening to an appropriate level to maintain what you think is, is significant. Um, left to um, its own devices, landscape changes. Landscape is not static. And there's often a, a, a myth that a natural landscape is one where humans don't intervene. Well, it is, but that's not a static landscape. And if you leave things alone, bracken will grow, some species will dominate, uh, water courses will overflow or fill, uh, and you get either bogs forming or things drying out completely. So somewhere like the Kurok, which is an internationally important wildlife site, um, we have to manage. Uh, you have to manage the drainage levels, you have to manage, dare I say it, uh, little pesky things like wallabies eating things they shouldn't be, uh, they should be eating. And on the calf, for example, we've intervened with the support of DEFA, the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, uh, to try and eradicate the, the long tail. Because if you want puffins, you want shearwaters, they're not compatible with with uh, rodents that eat the eggs. So there is a degree of, of looking after it. I mean, what about um, the actual physical sites themselves, things like Peel Castle? Um, we know there was an intervention. Was it Governor Locke who intervened um, to preserve what was there at the time, what was remaining of it? Um, there must be, though, a constant process of keeping that stable, I suppose. D- different sites have different cycles of, main, of, of maintenance. I um, m- remember asking one of my, my team 
what the cycle of maintenance was for pointing the walls because um, if you don't point the walls gradually all the mortar will run out from between them and the wall will collapse and he said well it's about every 25 years I said when did we last do it I said about 25 years ago um, whereas the, the Laxa wheel um, we know that the um, that's a very extreme environment it's not just because everything's underwater um, when the wheel is running uh, but also the, where, where it sits in the valley with the, the, the wind and the rain. And there the repainting and timber repair cycle is about seven years. Um, so um, you, you, you have to go back to stabilize, to keep the status quo. Um, some things have lasted very well. We've, people may have seen the scaffolding we've just had up at Russian, uh, sorry, Castle Russian. Um, huge amount of scaffolding to do one very small area on the um, on the roof, on the top of the flag tower, uh, which was getting water penetration. And we think that was, well, we know it was last done uh, around about 1909. Um, before then, it may have been about 1816. So, so some things will last more than one lifetime, um, but most of our buildings were never designed uh, to last that long. Monitoring the condition of them then must be very important. It is. We use a technique called conservation management planning, uh, which starts off by understanding the building, uh, understand how it was put together, how it, how it works. So uh, Castle Russian, we spent a, a lot of time you know, looking at every room, uh, looking behind the paint, looking behind the plaster, trying to identify what's the original. And also things like um, if a wall has been uh, increased in height in previous years, um, whether there was any anything left of the roof. Because if someone has left lead or slate inside a wall, uh, when water comes through, as water always does come through, uh, and it hits the slate or the lead, it then comes out at that point, um, not necessarily finding its way to the bottom or breathing normally, as you'd expect moisture in a, in a, in a wall to do. So we, we try and understand the techniques, how something's been built, how it's working now. Um, we're doing lots more high-tech uh, work, so we use laser scanning uh, quite uh, quite a lot, which will give us the exact dimensions of a building and also tell us whether the building's moving, whether there's any cracks appearing. Um, uh, recording is very important because we're in it for the long term, uh, so we need to be able to come back in 5, 10, 50 years' time and see what the difference is. Now, in terms of... Uh m &H as it is. What is the structure of the organisation? We know there's a board of trustees and we know there is a link with government through the funding that it receives, but how does the organisational structure work? Well, the, the organisation's been um, been a trust ever since it was established. Uh, and, the, and fundamentally, trust uh, means that a group of individuals have been given the responsibility to, to look after something. Um, clearly, the, as the responsibilities have grown, the support that's been received from, from government has been invaluable. It's not a sustainable organisation otherwise. And it's interesting that that support goes back to the 1880s. Um, it's one of the oldest partnerships, I think, in existence between the, um, what became the government and what became M&H. Arguably, M&H is older than the Isle of Man government, of course, um, because it, uh, when it was started, it, we were still working with a governor uh, uh, as well as Tynwald. But the, um, the arm's length relationship works, works well because a lot of what we do is technical and professional. Uh, there aren't complicated policy issues around looking after old buildings. Um, you know, the, the politics of heritage are not very controversial. And, and it's right that, the, the, that uh, this is done at arm's length. I think it's also uh, the organisation has uh, important advisory functions uh, in planning. We, we quite often have to uh, express an opinion on the heritage merit or significance of a particular piece of, of, of building or landscape. Um, and you want a degree of independence to be able, so that people can trust what you're saying, that you've not been um, you know, forced down a particular route uh, because of political uh, circumstances. Um, so we, we, the trustees have an important 
role in the community. They're, they're independent at arm's length from, from government. They can speak their mind should they wish. Um, by and large, um, they don't say anything particularly controversial. Um, and other people are saying the same thing. Um, we support campaigns, for example, on single-use plastics. Uh, you know, happy for people to use our facilities to help spread that message. We don't ourselves do anything particularly loud, uh, but it's clear that we we share a lot of the the, the values. Uh, the government provides at the moment about three quarters of our day-to-day -day operational uh, funding, and probably about a half of our development funding. Uh, there's quite a lot of capital funding that's available, but at the moment we've, we haven't had any really big projects in recent years. But I mentioned the flag tower at Castle Russian. That was supported by the, um, uh, by the government through its capital program. But the work on the, the PEGI and the building the PEGI is in uh, is entirely funded from, um, from the trustees' charitable reserves. Um, so I think it's a, it, it is a good example of a partnership which adds value. Um, we are uh, you know, hugely supported by the taxpayer, and, and obviously the trustees are very, you know, you know, they're very pleased with that. They're very grateful for that. But they don't sit back um, and just do what the taxpayer gives them money for. We generate significant amounts of income ourselves through our own hard, you know, through the, the team's hard work. Um, around about a million pounds a year we, we generate in various forms through ticketing and retail and, and catering and rental and things like that. Uh, we even sell the odd sheep. Um, but um, it's that partnership that works well, I think. Now, in terms of costs for an organisation, for many organisations, staffing costs can be the biggest burden. I mean, how, how, what's that balance like for Max National Heritage? We've taken a conscious decision over recent years to have a, a high public, uh, a high level of public service. So we have a number of sites which are open to the public, and there is a minimum staffing required to keep those open. And um, in recent years, we've come under a lot of um, pressure, I suppose, is a perfectly reasonable request to extend the opening times. Traditionally, the, 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 the tourism season on the island was the, was the, the uh, May bank holiday to the August bank holiday. Um, we are now open, uh, in some cases, from uh, uh, half term in February right the way through to November. So inevitably staffing uh, at certain levels to be safe, um, uh, nine, you know, 10 till 5, uh, seven days a week, um, and in some cases, 360 days a year, House of Manana and the Manx Museum. Um, uh, that does take up a significant percentage of our, of our budget, and those, are, those costs are relatively fixed. You can't change them. And um, uh, inflation has meant that people have had pay awards which have been, been more than the money we've had available. Now, now we're not the only uh, museum in the British Isles. Uh, there's a, a, a network of, of several thousand operations and we benchmark ourselves against them. And on, on average, a large public sector uh, operation like ours running a number of sites will be spending between 65 and 70 percent of its, uh, of its uh, budget on staffing. Um, and that's challenging. And I, I hear people say, oh, you could use volunteers. We do use volunteers. We we reckon we've got well over two hundred volunteers working 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 with us, and they add considerable value. Um, they do lots of things for us, whether it's gardening, working behind the scenes on digitisation, helping us sew uh, sew things in terms of costume collections, um, and so on and so on. And we, we couldn't deliver the level of public services that we uh, that we do without the volunteers that who, who gen generously give us their time. But the core functions, I think, of a highly professional public body that's open 10 till, 10 till 5, uh, in my view, should be uh, delivered by paid staff. So I think we, so we do have a core of, of skilled, of trained uh, paid staff. And then we use volunteers, in many cases, to supplement what, what they offer. How much interaction is there with other heritage organizations uh, both locally and 
wider, I mean worldwide, in terms of that heritage network? I think the simplest answer to that is not enough. Um, I think locally we have a, a great network of, 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 of many um, uh, local heritage organizations doing incredible work. Uh, we see our role is to help them with the infrastructure for that. So I remember, and, and Hugh Davison still talks about it, I think, uh, in Russian, the, the development of the Heritage Trust in Russian, we had a conversation about how it should start and what it should do. And, and I suggested that they, they focus not on buildings but on activities. All too often, heritage organizations focus on a building. Uh, they're saving a building and then they have to find something to, to do with it. And what they've been doing in, in Russian is, is using volunteers to research particular topics, exhibiting in the local hall, publishing um, uh, that, that work for a wider audience. And that's really good. And what we do is make available the collections that we have, the resources. And it's now, um, I think, seven years or seven years old. The Eye Museum, one of the greatest technological projects the island has seen. Um, we hold more data um, in, on our servers about Manx heritage uh, than the entire government put together of everything else. Um, so the photographs, the family history, uh, the, the, the maps, the recordings, video, and so on, the sound, uh, dating back to those, you know, those original Gaelic recordings made and the orders of President de Valera, um, uh, when, when he came to the island, uh, those iconic things which preserve the Manx language. We hold all of that and we make it available. So it allows the local uh, community organisations to, to do their thing with the backup of a, of, a, of a large professional body. We've helped some of the smaller groups with their documentation. I think helped the, the guys in Peel at the Heritage Trust um, document their collections. We do joint ticketing with other people, such as Milne Town, um, and the um, uh, you know in working with uh, the, the railway heritage people and Groudle, um There's there's quite a network of people coming to, coming together. Beyond the um, the shores of the island, uh, we're very proud of the reciprocal arrangements we have with people like the National Trust in the UK, National Trust for Scotland, English Heritage. Um, Jersey Heritage, well, and those allow members, uh, you know, our, our MNH members and friends, um, access to that wider, wider heritage, and obviously we welcome people from those bodies coming here. But some of that is also about professional networks. So we're working with uh, Historic England on a very technical piece of work about how we record heritage uh, and developing a new computer system which is compatible with what they use in, in London, Lincoln and Jersey. Um, one of the interesting points about heritage is it doesn't respect modern political boundaries. Um, so the Vikings, a good example, who didn't respect any political boundaries. Uh, and so you have Viking material in Cumbria, uh, on the Isle of Man, uh, in Galloway, a recent find there. And it's almost identical. So when people are searching for it, they don't search the Isle of Man Lancashire and so on. So we, we try and work across boundaries. And that's going to be interesting. Uh, it wouldn't be, you know, you're never going to have an interview that doesn't mention Brexit in some form. Um, but we're very keen to work with the Council of Europe, not the EU, the Council of Europe, um, which gives us a framework where we can talk to these other bodies without worrying too much about the, the political complexity of nation, you know, your current bound, boundaries. Um, the cultural elements of Europe, such as the Viking, such as the pilgrimage route, such as the megalithic, um, the industrial heritage, uh, these are all cross-boundary. And um, it's great to work alongside colleagues. Um, and the island is fascinating to them because most people don't realise what we've actually got. And in terms of the island's heritage, how similar is it to what you would find elsewhere in the British Isles? I mean, how, how does it compare? Individual components of the the Manx culture, the Manx community, the Manx, Manx heritage are, are remarkably similar to, to other, other places. Um, and I say this because I, I, I'm always amused by things like the uh, Southern um, Vintage Machinery Club, um, who are proudly 
um, uh, wandering around in Fordsons and Fergusons and things like that, um, and uh, uh, tractors and, and vehicles, which for the most part were not made on the island. They're, they're used on the island, but they're not made on the island. And before I came here, I worked in Lancashire, and I had a large shed which was stuffed full of agricultural machinery, and I come here and I see the same agricultural machinery. Now, that's one similarity. The difference is the cultural traditions, the language, uh, what's actually being farmed and the way it's being farmed, uh, the landscape it's being farmed in. Um, so you have uh, one element which is similar, but then a distinctive Manx quality. Uh, in the same way, um, the engines on the railway are built in Manchester. But the track, uh, the things they're carrying, the scenery they're passing through, is a uniquely Manx experience. And I think they, um, the fusion of cultures from the Celtic tradition to the Norse tradition to the Victorian infrastructure um, have left the island with something which is unique and distinctive, no doubt about it. Um, it's, it's, I can see why it's very precious to the people who live here. I can see whether it's very attractive to the people who come here. And on an intellectual basis, uh, the position of the island in the Irish Sea um, has meant that inf it has been influenced by and it has influenced a significant number of other cultures throughout the last 10,000 years. So I was talking to uh, people in, in Sweden, um, uh, sorry, Norway last week, they're based in Sweden, uh, who run something called the Megalithic Cultural Route for Europe. And megaliths, as, 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 you, know, as you know, are these great stone uh, structures that mainly relate to burials, and they include things like Stonehenge on the one, th one thing, but also some of the great um, uh, tombs of northern Scotland. And Spain has them, and France has them, and Sweden has them, and Norway has them, and the Isle of Man has them. And the reason the Isle of Man has, has them is because, until fairly recently, the sea was the main highway. So people travelling uh, from what is now Spain um, would find it fairly easy to go up through the Irish Sea. So Cornwall, Wales, Ireland, the Isle of Man, Scotland have all got elements of the same tradition. And that um, melting pot, really, of, of cultures is the hallmark of the island. Um, it's very difficult to see anything um, in England that has got so many different traditions. Um, and and that's, that's really good, really strong, really important. How do you cope with the changing expectations and demands of visitors to the island who will come and see the sites um, but have experienced a lot of other things in other places? It's difficult for those who are either um, from the island long term or, or who've not visited elsewhere recently or who aren't in the trade uh, to realise the a massive investment that there's been worldwide in, in heritage and cultural facilities. Um, there's some brands like the Louvre and the Guggenheim, which are international. And this week, the, the, the v &A opens the doors of a new museum in Dundee, which has only cost £80 million. Pounds. And those who have been to Liverpool recently might have seen the new Museum of Liverpool on, on the uh, waterfront there, which I think was £63 million. Uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, um, in the British, in, well, the UK specifically, has delivered, I think, £18 billion in the last 20 years into heritage, culture and, and natural environment. Um, that's a big investment. And that's been paralleled by the sort of work that people like Disney do in investing in their infrastructure, uh, the work that other private sectors, op private sector operators do Ferrari world, if, if, if I use that. Um, so expectations have been raised. And sometimes people say, well, d d does that matter? Who's going to go to Ferrari world? And in response, I, I would suggest that people look at the route map for EasyJet. Because a traveler from Liverpool can make a choice. Uh, they can turn up at the airport and they can say, 
Should I go to the Isle of Man or should I go to Reykjavik or should I go to Vilnius? No, I'll go to Barcelona. And we are competing in that, in that market. And if we don't provide the same quality of, of, of displays, of experience, of graphics, of toilets, of catering, uh, of retail, of hospitality, of friendliness, of ticketing, uh, of taxi driving skills, and so on, um, then eventually we will lose. We will lose out, and I think that's that's an important message for for the island. And we have improved our facilities. Um, there is a good response. Um, it's not the only thing we look at, but our TripAdvisor ratings, yeah, you know, are quite high. People are very satisfied with what we have to offer. What I suspect is that a number of the people coming here on holiday are not habitual museum visitors. They won't. They probably don't go and visit their local museum, but they come and visit them here when they're on holiday, um, and, and they are surprised. But then there are other people who are, uh, like National Trust members, who are visiting a great many heritage attractions and one of the reasons for example we've um, recently employed a, a new uh, gardener and horticultural manager is the recognition that people's expectations have been driven up by the amazing quality of the National Trust um, uh, if you visit one of their sites you will see some absolutely incredible gardens um, and then there are programs all over the television on gardening uh, there are magazines about gardening and so people come here expecting to see better quality gardens. So you are having to adapt to what people would expect. I think if we if we didn't adapt to what our audiences wanted, we would at the end of the day have a very narrow group of people. Um, those people who traditionally visit museums, uh, you then run the risk of being elitist, of of being a sort of place where people say shh to children. Um, or people don't want children in at all. Um, and it, you, again, run the risk of assuming that people have a certain knowledge um, and cultural literacy, if I use that term. Uh, some of the language that people use in art galleries is pretty impenetrable. And many of the time I've looked at a label in an art gallery in London and thought, I wonder what that meant. Um, it's, it's not my vocabulary. Um, and so... We have to, uh, if we want to make this a democratic, um, a, a proper, properly accessible, properly accountable organisation, then we've got to use the language that people use, we've got to use the techniques, and we've not got to exclude people. I think that's perfectly uh, legitimate. Now, you've mentioned recent developments. I mean, you mentioned Castle Russian and the, the changes there. Um, it delayed the start a little bit. There was a little bit of controversy over the, the late start to the season at Castle Russian. What response have you had to those changes so far? Uh, they've been overwhelmingly positive. Um, uh, they've not necessarily been terribly vocal because what, a lot of what we did was quite subtle. When we walked around some, some months back, um, we were I think I was having to point things out which weren't obvious because what we'd done is respected the building. We'd, we'd respected its heritage and our interventions were quite subtle. So many of the visitors that are, are, have, have been coming this year don't realise we've done anything because they, they don't remember it, um, either because it was so long ago or they haven't visited before. But certainly the, the, the visitor figures uh, have, have, have uh, picked up. They're about the same as they were last, last year. Um, the amount that we're selling the shop has got, gone up. Um, and the, the, the satisfaction, uh, as far as we can measure it, is, is very positive. Um, I think more importantly, it's helped remove barriers by putting some judicious ramps in the right places. Uh, we've allowed families with children in, in, in buggies to, to use it. It's more accessible for people with li limited mobility. Um, uh, I don't, we don't count the number of wheelchairs, that's a very artificial distinction. But we've been very careful to, to make it clear to people that it is accessible um, in the same way that we've, we've introduced the new Changing Places facility at the Manx Museum. It's only a small number of people that it affects, but for those people, it's a major impact. There must be limitations on how much you can do at certain sites to make them more accessible. Uh, it, there's a well-established uh, legal precedent I think, that's been set 
again from from the UK, but it extrapolates to to the island. Um, that we are required under the legislation to make reasonable adjustments. So we can't simply claim an exemption and say, oh, it's all too difficult. Uh, but the definition of what's reasonable has to take into account what people are coming to see in the first place. So it's technically, technically, perfectly feasible to put a big modern lift up the side of Castle Russian. Technically, it's feasible. It would cost a fortune. Um, and people would be furious that we damaged and destroyed um, the, the visual impact. We would have wrecked, in my view, what people had come to see in the first place because it would be impossible to see round this new modern structure. Uh, and it's perfectly clear that that would be unreasonable. But what we've done by putting uh, powered doors in there uh, judicious ramps and cut away some of the um, the 19th century timber work uh, to give access. We have made reasonable adjustments, and we're carrying on doing that. We've done th um, 3D um, uh, scanning of the interior, so we can give people who can't access beyond the ground floor um, a a view into um, the, uh, the the rooms that they can tr control. So it's it's important that it's a change of mindset as much as anything, saying how do we remove the barrier? Well, what is the barrier in the first place? Sometimes it's not a physical one, it's an intellectual one. Are we using the right language? Are we using enough pictures or are too many words? Are the words too long? Um, is the lighting wrong? Is it too noisy? And so we look at all these things now and say, um, what's a reasonable adjustment to the way we do things? Often the adjustments are as simple as putting a, um, a, a subtitle um, on a video. Not everything needs a, a commentary, um, and sometimes we do things with subtitles, and sometimes we provide a copy of a script um, so that those people who have hearing difficulties uh, can read the script separately. So sometimes the, the challenge is to, to think about it, not actually the cost of doing it. Now, in terms of satisfaction with the sites and what you have to offer, do you monitor that? Do you survey that? Do you know, do you get feedback from visitors so you know what they like, what they don't like, what you need to work on? All of the above. Um, we do a variety of, of, of survey. Sometime about every three years, we do a major investment in survey where we, we, where we actually bring in trained market research professionals to accost people and do a structured interview, so it's quite in depth. Uh, we do that about every three years, sometimes sometimes three, sometimes four. Um, we regularly invite people to self-survey, so we give them a printed survey, say, would you like to fill this in? Um, we profile people in, in the sense that uh, we try and work out how many there are in a group so that we know whether adults are coming with children and, and so on. We know from our ticketing whether people are uh, visiting from across or whether they're local or so because they're using different tickets uh, so we collect a lot of, a lot of information um, I can assure you that if people don't like what they um, uh, they get we're the first people to hear about it um, and usually immediately we, we you know the email the email will arrive um, uh, with uh, with some level of dissatisfaction if people are dissatisfied. And I welcome that. Um, I deal with a lot of those myself um, because it's feedback. And if something has gone wrong, I want to know about it. Absolutely. Um, the worst thing would be if we never found out and that person just stopped coming. That that would be the worst thing. So um, we, we welcome feedback. We give people plenty of opportunities to, to give it. And we, we allow people, you know, to, to comment on our Facebook pages and TripAdvisor is, uh, and other other review sites are available um, but I think, you know, the Manx Museum now has about seven or 800 reviews on TripAdvisor, uh, warts and all. Most of it's very positive. I mean, we had a four, four, four and a half star out, out of five. Um, and all our sites are, um, are four star or above on, on TripAdvisor. And over the years, um, you can see where we've had to address particular things. And if people are saying the same thing, um, time time again, we, we know we need to address that.
how do you i suppose how do you, how do you put a value on heritage within any community i suppose but particularly here in the isle of man well that's a conversation you should have with our auditors um because i can tell you that simultaneously something like castle russian is priceless and worthless because we're not going to sell it um it is a liability in that it requires money to maintain it it is a priceless asset as the symbol of of, of nationhood and that's the complexity um, what we we use as, as a technique is something which is a, established by international convention and, and over the last 30 years it's a technique that's being refined and it's uh, the assessment of significance and, and what it says is that a a cultural asset or a historic asset can have significance in a number of categories. Um, for example, are there any historical figures associated with it? Are there any historical events associated with it? Does it have architectural or uh, architectural merit or visual significance? Um, is it complete or incomplete? Um, is it a duplicate or is it one of a kind? And as, as you go through a series of questions, like in a structured way, you can begin to score things one against, one against the, the, the other. And um, that, that would mean, for example, that if you looked at a site that's been in the news recently, um, uh, the old police station in Castletown, in good condition, unique, associated with the famous architect, and iconic in terms of its design. Uh, tick, tick, tick. Um, box ticking is actually, in some cases, a useful exercise because the more things score, the easier it is to, is, is to rank them. Um, and if you look at the, um, uh, the horse tram stables, architecturally, not that significant. Um, intact, yes associated with significant historical association on the end? Yes. Um, and because it scores so highly in that, in, the, in that category of its association, um, that overrules the fact that it might not be you know, a, major, a major building. Uh, it's certainly not like Castle Mona in that sense. Um, and that, that's how we build up a picture of, of, of what its significance and, and uh, we, we make our priorities accordingly. I think our challenge as Manx National Heritage is that 99% of what we have is of significance. Uh, that's why we have it. And measuring one against the other is always challenging. Um, in terms of, I, mean, I mentioned our audit, we don't put values in our audit of sites that are really incapable of being valued, even though they're priceless. And in terms of tourism in the Isle of Man, uh, Manx National Heritage, we've touched on it you know, through various parts of the conversation, um, has a role to play alongside things like the Heritage Railways in attracting people to the Isle of Man. Is it sold enough off-island? Is there enough done to let people know about the heritage that there is here in the island? I think that's the classic how long is a piece of string question. Um, is it, could it be sold more? Yes. Are we allocating enough resources to doing that? Probably not. Um, are we doing enough? I think we're doing a lot. Um, we, we, uh, a lot of it's not visible because we've chosen not to advertise on television all the time. Um, there aren't great billboards around every major airport in the, in the UK. Um, but quite often you'll see on the back page of something like the Daily Telegraph um, an advert from one of the companies that's selling high, high, you know, holidays to the island. And, and we know that, um, I've mentioned people like EasyJet before, EasyJet, British Airways, Flyby, we work with all these people to make sure that opportunities to sell the island are, are, are maximised. Um, I think the question is what's appropriate and what's proportionate. Um, it would be inappropriate to spend the same amount of, as, of money as Ireland spends attracting. Um, and if we got the same number of visitors that Ireland gets, we'd be swamped. We, we, you know, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't cope. 
So I, th I think the important thing is that we work together uh, with colleagues in, in, the, in the tourism team, in government, uh, with railways and with Milltown, with Groudle Glen. And we're offering a package which is recognised, it's growing. Um, we'll be going with our colleagues in railways to the world travel market. Uh, we've done that before. We go to trade fairs in, in other parts. of. Um, there's a good trade fair in Birmingham we go to each year. And uh, that's 50,000 delegates from all around the world, major tour operators. And that allows us to go to people who already come to the island, the people we work with, and just check everything's going fine. And sometimes you actually don't need to spend a lot of money. You just have to have a conversation with the right people. Um, and we've been very successful at bringing new operators to the island. And the way we do that is with a familiarization visit. We bring no more than 10 people uh, from different companies. They get a trip on the railway. We take them to Castle Rush and they eat at the Sound. Um, and, um, you know, we, we usually, we often take them to Tinwald and, and, and they talk to people. And from that, we've been very successful get, uh, about getting new business. And actually, the cost has been quite minimal. And if we'd have advertised on television, we wouldn't have got that business because we hadn't actually gone and targeted the right the right person. So part of it is professionalism. It's knowing who to talk to. It's maintaining a relationship over time. We now go back and, um, you know, we're on first name terms with these people. Um, and um, the other important thing is that the island is, is small but well connected and it runs efficiently. So if someone has a problem, um, I have no difficulty in ringing up um, colleagues at the airport or in the hotel and saying, you know, this, this, this group is having a problem. Um, what can we do? What can we do about it? Um, and that works very well. Uh, Chamber of Trade, Chamber of Commerce, sorry, um, has a good tourism committee. Uh, we sh we problem solve. We do things together. And um, I think the island's uh, very effective now in developing and promoting tourism. But because people don't see big adverts everywhere saying come to the Isle of Man, um, they may not realise that some of this work is happening. And uh, this week... Uh, Last week I was in Oslo, I saw one cruise ship, came back to the island, I saw two. So, um, that's one way of measuring it. Um, but talking to colleagues in other places, I, I was talking to someone from Gotland, which is somewhere quite a few um, people from the island go as part of the island games. And they're facing exactly the same challenges with, with cruise ships as we are, and dealing with them in the same way. So that... Um, Having those international networks allows you to learn from other people's experiences, um, which means you don't make the mistakes. And uh, when you invest, you invest wisely and uh, and you get the benefits out of it. Now, there always, there's always going to be um, a certain number of people who say that or, ob or who object to money being spent on heritage, um, public money being spent on heritage, or that think that heritage itself should be essentially mothballed, should be kept as it is, preserved, so that it's there, so that it's safe, but not expanded or grown or, or I suppose, have more money than is absolutely necessary spent on it. I mean, I'm assuming you have... Assumptions are a dangerous thing, but I'm assuming you have a different stance than that. Um, if you take a cross-section of any population at any time, it, it, it will have different, different priorities. And if you ask me to choose between... Um, a competent dentist and a good library. Um, depending on the state of my my toothache at the time, uh, I might prefer one over the other. Um, and when times are hard, people take a, a long long look. Ironically, is that when times are hard um, and there is uncertainty, um, people actually look for stability. They look to their roots. They they look to their cultural identity and they look to their heritage. Um, and uh, that's hugely important. People like to be grounded. They like a sense of stability. They don't like uncertainty. Um, and we are seeing um, a, a tremendous growth in interest in, in people's heritage. And family history has been part of that. Um, probably about 70, 75% of the population of the island use our facilities uh, in any one year. Uh, across the British Isles, surveys suggest that 60% of um, of the population 
uh, use a heritage or cultural facility in any in any one year. But if you ask the question, um, would they want it, would they want it abolished or not being there? Then they respond very differently. Um, the overwhelming majority of people in Western Europe and and beyond want to see heritage protected. Part of it's almost like an insurance policy. They not they may not personally use it, um, but they still think it's important. And um, I, I think uh, the role of heritage and culture in a national identity uh, is almost sacrosanct. Um, you couldn't pretend that this island is not what it is. You you you, you can't ignore ten thousand years of, of history. You can't ignore the last five hundred years um, of British influence. You can't ignore the Celtic and Norse Im- impact. You would be foolish to do that. And if you want to attract people to the island, uh, to invest, to live, to work, to bring up their families, um, you've got to present it as a place with a quality of life, a place that cares about itself and, and, and its heritage is part of caring about yourself. If you said, oh, we don't care. We don't care about the heritage. We don't care about littering, littering the streets. We don't care about the potholes. We don't care if people uh, have to go to food banks. We, you know, we don't care. Uh, the appointments waiting list is so long. What sort of a community are you? And 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 caring for heritage is only one element of what makes a community strong. Yeah.